The local government news roundup is proudly supported by Davidson. For 30 years, Davidson has been strengthening the local government sector by identifying and providing the people, expertise and experience that local government needs to enhance its capability, productivity and performance. Davidson is nationally recognised for its executive recruitment services and over the past four years has built a business advisory practice rapidly evolving into one of the nation's foremost and trusted local government business consultancy firms. The Davidson methodology and approach is simple. Thinking beyond now and aiming to be a valued partner with your local government, not just for the immediate project, but for the next 30 years. Speak to Justin Hanney or Seamus Scanlon to find out more or head to davidsonwp.com.au. Davidson, your future, your partner. Coming up on the Local Government News Roundup, the Victorian Government's housing statement deemed irrelevant by VCAT, a Deputy Mayor ordered to apologise for a second time by an arbiter, the Victorian Council reported to be reconsidering its MAV membership, Kiama gets an updated performance improvement order from the Government, another Queensland Council CEO's future in question, and a UK Mayor loses a High Court challenge against the Government. Just some of the many local Government stories getting our attention today. Let's round them up. Hello, I'm Chris Eddy. Welcome to the podcast brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association, the national broadcaster on all things local government, with support from Davidson, the nationally recognised local government recruitment and business advisory service, presenting LG Innovate, the Artificial Intelligence Summit for the Local Government C-Suite at Perigian Beach in September. Early bird bookings are open now. The Victorian Government's central housing policy, aiming to build 80,000 homes a year, has been deemed irrelevant and powerless by the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal. The Herald Sun has reported on a VCAT ruling made in relation to a proposed 11-storey mixed-use development in North Essendon, with the Tribunal stating that the policy lacks the necessary planning regulations or instruments to give it legal and regulatory weight. The Property Council of Australia's Victorian Executive Director, Kath Evans, labelled the situation a red flag for the housing industry. A government spokesman said consultation needed to happen on new planning controls, which are expected to be introduced by the end of the year. The Age has reported on a pre-election plan by the Yimby Group to get council candidates to pledge not to block apartment developments. The pro-housing group aims to expand its influence in key inner city areas, with housing set to be a significant issue at the October elections. Yimby Melbourne leader Jonathan O'Brien said there is a need for pro-housing councillors and his group plans to monitor elected councillors' voting records to ensure they uphold their housing promises. Greater Geelong's Deputy Mayor Anthony Aitken is set to make a second apology to three fellow councillors after accusing them of having a predetermined view on plans for a Bellarine chocolate factory. The Geelong Advertiser reported that an arbitration process has found Councillor Aitken breached the Local Government Act's standards of conduct with his comments. Arbiter Yehudi Blasher ruled that Councillor Aitken should apologise again and that the decision be circulated to relevant media outlets in the municipality. He was also critical of the complainant councillors for not seeking to have the matter resolved internally, thereby subjecting ratepayers to the cost and time involved in an external arbitration. Wodonga Council is considering ending its $40,000 annual membership with the Municipal Association of Victoria due to concerns raised by Councillor Danny Chamberlain about voting practices at the recent State Council meeting. The Border Mail is reporting that Mayor Ron Mildren has also suggested reassessing the Council's involvement with the MAV, noting a growing philosophical and structural gap between Metropolitan and non-Metropolitan Councils. The Council's only motion at the recent MAV State Council meeting advocating for changes to water hydrant ownership legislation was supported. 
Greater Shepparton City Council Mayor, Councillor Shane Sarley, is backing a call from Fruit Growers Victoria for immediate implementation of key recommendations from the Senate inquiry into supermarket pricing conduct. The recommendations include increased ACCC power and resources, enhanced price transparency and a crackdown on poor supermarket behaviour. Emphasising the need for mandatory enforcement of the Food and Grocery Code of Conduct, Councillor Sarley said the fruit industry is crucial to Greater Shepparton's economy and it was important to support local growers for the region's long-term viability. Colac Otway Shire Council has committed to continue its role in the provision of aged care services, preparing for delivery under the Supported Home Program and other reforms introduced by the Commonwealth Government. CEO Anne Howard said the Council will narrow its focus to options that continue service delivery based on community feedback valuing the existing aged care services. The final mix of services is yet to be determined, but Ms Howard says the Council is committed to investing in management, support, technology, training and quality assurance. Also making news, a draft Ballarat Airport Strategy and Master Plan has been endorsed by Ballarat City Council and is now ready for community review. The plan has been informed by nearly 200 submissions from residents and over 50 business leaders and aims to increase connectivity, boost the economy and enhance emergency service capacity. Chelsworth Park in Ivanhoe is set to get two new public pavilions costing $14 million, funded by Ivanhoe Grammar School as part of a 40-year lease agreement with Banyul City Council. The pavilions will be used by the school and nine other community sports clubs, while the park will remain open to the public. And the $13 million second stage of the Mildura Sporting Precinct has officially opened, marking the completion of the largest infrastructure project ever undertaken by Mildura Rural City Council. The project, funded in part by the State Government, includes upgrades to lighting, cricket practice nets, a second multi-use oval, additional change rooms, a new social room, squash courts, netball courts, seating improvements and a sports administration hub. That's the Victorian Roundup for this edition. It's Monday the 27th of May. This is episode number 341 of the Local Government News Roundup, brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association, which is partnering again with LGIU this year on a series of global executive panels. The next is on the topic of resetting relationships between levels of government. This online event across Australia and the UK will take place on Thursday the 27th of June at 5 30 p.m. Australian time. Registrations are open now via the events page on the VLGA website. More news from around the country now, and Kiama Council has received a variation to its performance improvement order from the New South Wales Minister for Local Government. The varied PIO requires the Council to take actions over the next three years to improve its operating performance, including implementing a new strategic finance and governance improvement plan, reviewing the timing of service reviews and revenue opportunities, and investigating property holdings and investment opportunities. The PIO is listed for discussion at an extraordinary Council meeting this week, and bi-monthly progress reports are required to be provided to councillors and the New South Wales Government. Meanwhile, the Illawarra Mercury has reported that a third Kiama councillor in 12 months is the subject of a code of conduct complaint. Business papers reveal the council has incurred $4.7 million in legal fees up to March this year, including an amount of $5,200 for an external investigation of a complaint against an unnamed councillor. According to the Mercury report, the complaint was lodged by another councillor and is now at the detailed investigation stage. Narromine Shire Mayor Craig Davies has hit out at the New South Wales Government for a lack of support for cultural events in rural locations. His comments came after the news of the cancellation of the popular Narromine Dolly Parton Festival, which was to have been held for the third time in October. The event has been cancelled because a number of funding applications by the volunteer organising team were unsuccessful. A frustrated Mayor Davies told the Central Western Daily that cultural events in rural locations are ignored by governments who lack empathy and understanding. The Shire had committed $20,000 to the festival, far short of the $150,000 needed to run the event. 
Murray River Council will auction over 55 land lots to recover $583,000 in unpaid rates, some outstanding for more than five years. While the majority of the lots are vacant, there are some houses potentially up for sale. The Dinitiquan Pastoral Times reported that some of the listed property owners are deceased with no current owner or inheritor to pay the rates. The auctions will take place at the Moama Bowling Club on the 13th of July. The New South Wales government is providing support to encourage more women to run for local council. With $160,000 in funding for two women's organisations to host candidate information workshops. The Australian Local Government Women's Association and Women for Election will deliver workshops on leadership skills and campaign strategies. The initiative is part of a wider campaign to encourage greater diversity in candidate representation at the upcoming elections. Or on that topic in a special edition of Roundup Unfiltered with Ruth McGowan, OAM, and Kerry Wilson, which is available in your podcast queue now. Up to Queensland and the future of Toowoomba Regional Council CEO Brian Pidgeon's tenure is reported to be under pressure from the new council amid concerns about the organisation's work culture and leadership. The Toowoomba Chronicle reported that some stakeholders are questioning a lack of long-term planning, particularly around the imminent Cressbrook Dam safety upgrade. If significant government funding is not received, it could see the council's debt rise to $300 million. Mr Pigeon, whose contract is due for renewal next year, said he and his leadership team are committed to improving the organisation's culture and performance. The Queensland Environmental Regulator's decision to reject a carbon capture and storage proposal for the Great Artesian Basin is a victory for local communities, according to the Local Government Association of Queensland. LGAQ has welcomed the decision and says farmers, conservationists and councils are united in their call for a moratorium on further proposals. The decision follows calls from Queensland mayors for the state government to reject the carbon capture and storage proposal and for a moratorium. From Western Australia and the city of Joondalup is preparing to release an expression of interest for an e-scooter rideshare service for a 12-month trial period in its coastal suburbs. Perth Now reported that the council will vote on whether to advertise for an appropriate service to operate in areas west of Marmion Avenue. The e-scooters will be operational in the suburbs of Mullaloo, Callaroo, Hillary's and Sorrento, with geofencing technology limiting their use beyond set boundaries and automatically limiting speed in certain areas. Also making news, Queensland's Livingstone Shire Council has decided to discontinue briefing sessions and councillor portfolios in favour of a new standing committee structure. The new committees on infrastructure, recreation and culture and development and environment will meet monthly and make recommendations for ultimate decision at an ordinary council meeting. Mid Coast Council has announced it will commence talks with two preferred providers as it transitions away from providing aged and disability services. Negotiations are underway with Kiranari Community Services and Ability Options for future service provision after a request for proposals process. And Bundaberg Regional Council and the Urban Development Institute of Australia Bundaberg branch have signed an MOU to strengthen their partnership and attract investment. The MOU represents a significant milestone in addressing key issues and advocating for projects that support the growing region. A joint working committee will be established to raise issues relevant to the industry and its relationship with the Bundaberg region. The Global Roundup for you shortly here on the Local Government News Roundup. There's been a great response since the launch last week of an online global summit organised by author and speaker Diane Kalen Sucre on incivility and toxicity in public life today and how to combat it. Diane is bringing together a group of visionary civic leaders from around the world to share their strategies on tackling toxicity, bridging divides and renewing civic culture. It's a unique live event that will take place on the morning of Friday the 11th of October in Australia, which is the afternoon or evening on the 10th of October across North America and the UK. 
Pre-registrations are open now. The program is live and it's great to have the Victorian Local Governance Association on board as a supporter of this special event. Find out more at kalenacademy.com forward slash summit. All the details in the show notes and we look forward to seeing you there at the Tackling Toxicity, Cultivating Civility Online Global Summit. And just in case it wasn't clear, that Global Summit is a free event, but you do need to register to reserve your place. We're starting in the UK for our Global Roundup today. A UK mayor has lost a High Court case against the UK government over the use of a barge to house migrants. A High Court judge ruled that the Bibby Stockholm is not under the planning control of Dorset Council as it is not on land, according to a report from BBC News. The case was brought by Portland Mayor Carolyn Parks, who argued that the council could have prevented the barge from being moored at Portland Port. However, the judge concluded that the seabed and harbour could not be considered as land over which the council might have enforcement powers. Mayor Parks lost another High Court case last year when the same judge blocked her challenge to the Home Officer's decision to house migrants on the barge. Cambridge City Council has reportedly become the first in the UK to call for a ceasefire in Gaza and an end to arms sales to Israel. The council, run by a Labour majority, unanimously passed a motion urging the British government to pressure for a truce and to suspend arms sales to Israel. The Council also plans to investigate the implications of ceasing banking with Barclays due to its investments in companies arming Israel. The website Press TV has reported on the development and says no other UK City Council has passed a similar motion to date. From the USA, the Mayor of Chicago, Brandon Johnson, is facing opposition to his plan to cancel the city's contract with ShotSpotter, a gunshot sound detection system. The CEO of the company that makes the system has warned that the cancellation could result in loss of life, according to the website lawenforcementtoday.com. Critics, including BLM Chicago and hashtag Stop ShotSpotter, contend that the system is a form of racist technology predominantly deployed in black and Latino neighbourhoods. A city council vote on the issue is expected this week, with Alderman David Moore claiming he's gathered enough support from council members to force the mayor to wait for council approval for removal of the system. Commissioners at a North Carolina county are being sued by a residence group which wants to see the removal of a Confederate monument that they say explicitly supports slavery. USA Today reports that the concerned citizens of Tyrrell County argue that the phrase, in appreciation of our faithful slaves, which is inscribed on the monument, violates the 14th Amendment and that the monument creates a racially hostile environment. The county contends that a state law prevents removal of the statue. Briefly in other news, the UK's local government association has cancelled its annual conference due to a clash with the general election. The conference was scheduled for the 2nd to the 4th of July in Harrogate, but a general election has now been called for the 4th of July. The annual General Assembly meeting will still occur remotely on the 2nd of July. Madrid City Council in Spain has authorised a 75.2 million euro contract for 100% renewable energy supply for municipal buildings, set to begin on the 1st of September. The contract, which extends the current one, requires the successful bidder to prove that all of the supplied electricity is from renewable sources. And a by-election has been scheduled for next month to elect a new mayor and five councillors at Canada's city of Chestermere. The elected body was dismissed by the government last December, along with three chief administrative officers, after the city unsuccessfully tried to stop the dismissal in court. The by-election has been set for the 24th of June. And we'll stop in Canada for our final story today. In the face of criticism from the Ontario Ombudsman, Niagara Falls City Council continues to uphold a $500 fee for filing complaints about council members' conduct, according to a report from thepointer.com. A motion from a council member to consider advice from the Ombudsman and review the fee failed to attract a seconder and therefore failed. 
The council also rejected a motion to research the practices of other municipalities. The Ombudsman has criticised the council for its high fee, its requirement for complainants to be residents and its practice of splitting single complaints into multiple issues, each requiring a separate fee. And that brings us to the end of another edition of the Local Government News Roundup. This has been episode number 341, recorded on Monday the 27th of May 2024, and brought to you by the Victorian Local Governance Association with support from Davidson. You can find the links to the stories referenced in this episode and a full transcript at lgnewsroundup.com. The Local Government News Roundup is recorded in the city of Greater Geelong, Victoria, on the land of the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I'll be back with more local government news soon. Until next time, thanks for listening and bye for now.